Welcome to Who Runs This Park, a podcast where you are invited into the hearts and stories of those who have committed their careers to the protection and preservation of our great national parks. Who Runs This Park aims to be a catalyst for inspiration, highlighting all that goes into managing our national parks and building a sense of appreciation for the invaluable beauty, diversity, and history of our protected lands. Today, we get to hear the story of Jane Rogers, the superintendent of Joshua Tree National Park. Joshua Tree National Park is located in Southern California and has two desert ecosystems within it. Jane herself has been superintendent of Joshua Tree since August of 2023 and is very familiar with the park, previously serving as chief of science and resource stewardship, and before that as deputy chief of science and resource management at the Grand Canyon. Today, we get to hear a bit of Jane's heart for desert landscapes and conservation in general. Jane, welcome to Who Runs This Park. It's a joy to have you here today with us. Yeah, it's great to be here, Maddie. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, of course. Well, a way that I like to start off these conversations and kind of dive in is starting with highlighting one of the more unique situations you've had working as superintendent? Yeah, yeah. So I started, so in the park service, when there's a vacant superintendent, as you might imagine, there somebody is asked to help fill in. And uh, so right. I, I was filling in for a while. And I can't remember if it was while I was filling in or when I was formerly uh, put in at the, to the superintendency. But I would say a few things come to mind this year. Uh, one would be the Perseids Meteor Shower, which maybe Ooh. you've heard about in August. And that event is uh, pretty well known. You know, the the desert, I would say, over the last many decades has become a very favored place for people who love astronomy and you know, who love to look at the night sky and watch sort of, you know, astro- astronomical events happen. And I have a best friend who for many years, her birthday is in August, and she always celebrates by camping up in the park to watch the meteor oh, shower. Cool. Yeah, really cool thing to do. And she's invited me many times. And it's a great time to hang out with friends. And we, we never have a campfire because we want to maximize our visibility of the night sky and not affect right. um, our eyesight. Fast forward to 2023 and uh, building up to this year's Perseids events, which again, there are meteor showers throughout the year. Um, I would invite anybody to look it up online. You can find out when they happen. And Noah has some great information on that. But anyway, we uh, the Perseids is a meteor shower that happens every August. And this year, there seemed to be some buzz around the quality of the meteor shower event. And quality means a night sky condition where, for example, uh, the moon is absent from from viewing. And so you get really the, the darkest of sky qualities. You don't have this giant glowing orb in the sky to impact your view. And in addition to that, another outstanding feature of a great viewing opportunity is a clear night sky. So you don't have clouds or cloud cover or fog or something that might impact your visibility. So all these things were lining up as well as the timing of the event. So that as the sun's going down, it's getting darker and darker. We're starting to see meteor Um, the meteor shower happening. What we did not expect this year, although the park has been ready most years, you know, to a little bit of an increase in visitation during the meteor showers, this event got popularized throughout Southern California. And unfortunately, there was a lot of information that went out there that sort of implied that Joshua Tree was the only place on the planet that you could see this outstanding, spectacular meteor shower. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, and as you know, and that was this that was this year that it just happened to kind of that was the like in the news on TikTok or yeah. wherever. Yeah, tons of socials, uh, tons of uh, actual, you know, uh, TV news. Every every venue imaginable was broadcasting this amazing opportunity and sort of spinning up the the notion that Joshua Tree would be the most like perfect ideal and in some ways some descriptions hinting that it was the only place that you could see this phenomenon happen. Which of course anybody can see this uh, as long as you have some night sky. Um, some good, relatively decent night sky quality where you live. So an urban area with a lot of light pollution, not so much, but really anywhere in kind of a rural area, 
there's great opportunity. So the weekend came, we had staffed up a little bit just to be ready for the crowds. You know, if there were some, there's usually the campgrounds were looking full. But as the day got closer, we realized there was, it seemed like there was a ton of reservations coming in for going backpacking. And oh, interesting. Yeah. Backpack- and is that an uncommon time of year otherwise for people to be going backpacking? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the hottest time of the year. It's one of the hottest right. months. And it's really even an unusual time to camp, period. You know, the days are extremely right. hot. They can be humid that time of year with monsoonal activity if that's happening. But uh, hands down, you know, it's not something that I personally would do is to go camping in August in the desert. It's, it's really hot. <laughs> yeah, it seems, yeah. <laughs> seems hard. Yeah. But, you know, you, you have this event happening and people are getting so excited about it and they just want the right. opportunity to be out under the stars. And so we started seeing these backcountry permits that we issue sort of, you know, selling like hotcakes. And it really got us, you know, our attention. Unfortunately, the summertime is usually a time when we can really make allowances for our staff to take a much needed vacations and time off. And we have some staff who are furloughed. They're only paid uh, seasonally to work here at the park. So our our staffing was down and the numbers looked like they were going to really pick up. And then whammy, you know, Friday hits. And literally, we were getting reports of backed up traffic for miles from the entrance stations, Oh um, man! in some cases going all the way down to Interstate 10, which is quite far away. That's the main artery that's funneling people up here from uh, the Southland. And uh, the, the little highway we have up here um, on the northern edge of the park was just bumper to bumper traffic. And so we do have some social platforms up here that our communities created for, for the towns up here. And it's usually like to talk about traffic and talk about, you know, incidents like accidents or stuff like that. Right. And all these things socials were just blowing up like what's going on why are all these people here what's happening I can't I can't turn out of my driveway or um, our restaurant is running out of food like we literally oh my god had to close the restaurants because they ran out of food to feed people hotels were booked uh, people just couldn't get in anywhere it was just like this like uh, bottleneck situation and yeah. eventually I think it was maybe around nine o'clock at night might have been a little earlier we we did have the fee booth staff a little later but eventually we, we couldn't really collect fees anymore because the traffic was uh, so backed up and that becomes a safety hazard you know if we have Right. An incident in the park and you can't get emergency vehicles through the gate. You know, that's a problem. So anyway, at the end of the day, the weekend was an absolute blowout. It was the biggest weekend on record. And we wow. had um, literally like between five and eight hundred cars per hour pouring through our entrances. And what was really shocking was we had eight hundred cars an hour coming through our south entrance. That's the least popular entrance. Only about 20 percent of our visitors come through there. So it was really, it really took a lot of us by surprise. Yeah. Wow. I, well, first off, I didn't know that that meteor shower happened every year. So that's more of a fun tidbit for me to know about. But did that traffic start? Like, cause obviously I'm assuming you can't really see the meteor shower until it's dark outside. So were people just coming in to try and get a spot and like essentially wait? for the sun to set? Yes, some folks who planned ahead, I would say, did that. Uh, But then if you look at the traffic counters at our entrance stations, you'll see the uptick really started a little bit later into the evening, you know, probably an hour or two after sunset. And it was just rolling uh, until uh, four o'clock in the morning. Wow. And I can imagine, you know, if I lived in like one of those houses that was an artery to the main entrance I would also be confused if starting at like 9 p.m. I can't get out of my driveway I'd be like that you know something I would assume also honestly that something was wrong yeah if I didn't know that the meteor shower was happening yeah that's a lot it was it was pretty crazy did you get to see any of the like meteor shower while managing all of that uh no I did not I did not I was in San Diego. My my family lives in San Diego and my mom is uh, older now and and needs some some help. And so I try to get down there once a month. And that just happened to be the weekend I was down there. So my phone was blowing up from staff sending me messages and park partners sending me photographs of like the lines of traffic, just like these, uh, this like squiggle of light. So you could see all the lights from the cars coming in and out of the park. And it was just phenomenal. And there's just like, you know, miles of lights coming in out of the park. Yeah. How do you, you know, in situations like that where you're not 
at the park and something's happening, how do you typically manage that? Yeah, that's a good question. We So parks really operate a, a couple of different ways for like non-emergency situations. We rely on Nowadays, it's our phones, just like anybody else. So we have our principal, our leadership team, all of the senior staff members. You know, we typically have a chat going on through our, our phones, some, a text message, and we'll just keep each other apprised of what's happening. And if, if it's decisions that can be made without putting eyes on it, you know, we can go ahead and manage that virtually um, if it's something right. that needs eyes on it or, or something like that. Typically, there's there's always somebody who is delegated authority to act on behalf of the superintendent. Yeah, so typically there's like we have six different division chiefs that uh, manage different aspects of the operations, and each one of those uh, rotates once a month as the oh. acting superintendent. Yeah, and that before becoming superintendent, you were one of those chiefs for the science and research stewardship. One of the questions I had with that is in my research, I understood, and you can fill in the blanks here, but that role typically focuses on climate change responses, visitor use management, and stewardship collaborations. As you've transitioned into the superintendent role, how do you feel your focus has shifted in this new position? In some ways, it, it hasn't shifted as far as those three, the three kind of main drivers of um, things we right. need to be paying attention to at the park. But the capacity to which I'm interacting with those priorities is different, you know, so I'm obviously more in a dis decision maker spot. I am much more directly collaborating with park partners who are outside of what might be typical sort of resource manager or science manager world. So that's interfacing more with local governments, the county, you know, different, different levels of our surrounding communities or other agencies that we partner with. So that's a little bit different but that's exciting for me because those are places where, you know, we can grow those relationships and help, you know, working with partners achieve our mission, you know, and help address the concerns that we have because, you know, no park operates as an island. No park can do it alone. No. I mean, frankly, no, nobody can really do it alone. Everybody really needs partners wherever you're, you're working or whatever you're doing. But certainly being a celebrity national park in Southern California, we really rely on those partnerships to help help us best manage and take care of the park. Yeah, I previously, a few months ago, interviewed David Smith, who for folks who are not aware, was the previous superintendent of Joshua Tree and is now at Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And in my conversation with him, he cared. There was a lot of, you know, like conversations showing that he really cared deeply about engaging local communities. Um, and it sounds like that has transferred over to you and that that's something you also care about. And even just mentioning like the opportunity to work with partners and stuff. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what some of those current partnerships are that you have really strong ties with and have relied on. And then what are some partnerships you want to strengthen in the future? Yeah, there's you know, I'm really lucky to be to have the baton handed over to me from David and to have worked with him for the last seven years. So we were really uh, almost connected at the hip in a lot of ways. He was really the front face of the park, front face for developing partnerships and relationships, for identifying emerging issues. And my role is much more as problem solving, you know, helping with problem solving with the team and then finding a, a, essentially that path forward to take action. And, right. you know, tie a bow on stuff, get things to the finish line, um, Yeah, because we all have great ideas. And even with our partners, we all have everybody's got great ideas. But can you actually make them happen? And can you yeah. tell and, which ones? And the time and budget that you, you know, all the constraints. Have. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And knowing, you know, some some great ideas are not the right time or not the right fit. Right. So being discerning. So the partnerships were that are really strong right now that that I'm continuing to collaborate with and make a priority are at a lot of different levels, whether that's academia, uh, nonprofits or local governments or constituents. Those are all it's almost like uh, they're all very equal on an equal playing field because they all play really different roles that are important for the park. The communities right. of, uh, you know, Yucca Valley, 29 Palms, uh, the unincorporated community of Joshua Tree in the county have all been great partners to help uh, really have that conversation about tourism, the development of tourism in the local area and ways that we can really try to keep a focus on what I call sustainable tourism. You know, that uh, we want to have, there's a particular experience we're trying to create and maintain here at Joshua Tree that involves the 
preservation of this ecosystem that involves the preservation of 7,000 years of human history on this landscape. And that nexus with tourism has to be done very thoughtfully and very, you know, with some vision. And the missions of our local governments or chambers of commerce or in the park don't always, you know, it's not always like the Venn diagram completely overlapping each other, but we can find that common ground. And I feel like, you know, my responsibility is continuing to stay in dialogue around that and continuing to raise either concerns about protecting the park or concerns about creating a sustainable experience and kind of work in that space with our, our partners. The big, you know, kind of our big friends groups, we call them. These are the philanthropic relationships we have with nonprofit uh, entities include the Mojave Desert Land Trust, uh, Friends of Joshua Tree, uh, the Joshua Tree uh, Residential Education Experience, also known as JTree, uh, and then really our official park partner, which of course is the Joshua Tree National Park Association that we've partnered with for over 60 years. And so between all of those entities that all reside in the high desert, uh, we continue partnering with them to really share, you know, our mission, our vision, the goals that we're setting, our objectives, and then they're finding ways to support us through their various programs. Yeah, that's awesome. The I have a couple of things that have come to mind. The first is more so a comment, and this has come up, I forget, it's come up a couple times in some of the conversations I've had with superintendents, but I think something really interesting about the national parks is you're preserving Like you said, it's that sustainable tourism you're preserving, but you also don't want to cut it off and not let people to engage with it because that's not really aligned with the mission of what the National Park Service was created to do. So that does create kind of this juxtaposition, you know, because it would be easiest to be like, you know, to preserve the ecosystem, no one's allowed, but that's not the goal. And so I find that a very interesting and challenging thing probably for the parks to manage, especially post COVID and as people are seeking to experience these national parks more. I can see that being a challenge. The other question, or this is more of a question, but what does the, what do academia partners look like? I feel like I have a foothold ish on the nonprofit partners and understanding kind of local government and constituent engagements, but don't fully necessarily understand the academia part of it. Sure. Yeah. So just a a thought about the tension between um, uh, parks being here for the enjoyment and the experience of visitors and the public both. I mean, it's truly international, national. If parks are so critical for for people, people need open space, they need challenge, (laughs) they need opportunities to get away, you know, from their busy lives or work and enjoy time with their families and friends. And, you know, the tension is really, personally, I think it's, it's manageable, but it takes discipline and an investment Mm. and really truly understanding the resources. And by resources, I mean, you know, the landscape, the plants, the wildlife, Uh, the archaeology, the history, the relationship between our tribal communities in this place. And if you can do that, you know, you really can, you can create that space for what I consider sustainable tourism, but it, it has to be done with, you know, vision and thought and care, and you can't just take your foot off the gas with that. So with that, uh, to have that information to inform decision-making one great source of that are nearby universities or even far away. We've actually worked with Clemson University. Um, Oh, cool. Yeah. On the other side of the country. So so there are, there are uh, specialists and people whose area of expertise is specific to either outdoor recreation management, recreation, tourism, uh, plant ecology, wildlife, ecology, GIS, you know, all of the sciences. I mean, there's just a vast portfolio of institutions that are eager to work with national parks to help solve problems. And in fact, it's part of our National Park Service mission. You know, if you look at the enabling legislation, which is the the legislation that set aside Joshua Tree as a national monument originally, it even, that legislation even talks about the opportunity for scientific investigation that that's actually part of our, if you look at National Park Service policy, you'll find that that's this cool. notion of, yeah, parks as laboratories, that these are places that we have not developed um, significantly. That um, And I'm talking more about sort of the big Western parks, not so much like the historic battlefields or historic right. sites. 
but you know there's there's some really vast acreage that has been protected that can lend itself to learning and understanding our environment and that's truly a role that the the park service can play but having said that you know our mission we are not research level scientists that's you know we're we're park rangers we have a number of specialists we do have biologists we have archaeologists mm-hmm. But they're more applied in the sense of, you know, using information, collecting data to a certain extent, applying that for decision making or correcting yeah. some some issue that we have. But it's, you know, universities, whether that's, um, you know, we partnered quite a bit with the University of California. A lot of the California based national park units are part of the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit. That is a consortium oh, of different campuses. Yeah, it's really, really cool. It's um, it's a consortium that's come together of a range of different campuses, not just the UC system, but they have negotiated with the Park Service on how to collaborate and sort of what that authority would be, you know, how we would exchange funding, that we could provide funding to the university right. to help us answer questions. And it meets their mission for continued research. And uh, hopefully, you know, they may get a publication out of it or something like that. So that's been a really great partnership. Um, we do have we do have federal partners as well. So the U.S. Geologic Survey, which of course is a, a really important research branch of the federal government, it's in the same department that we are, the Department of the Interior. They're one of our sister agencies, and they have uh, an amazing cadre of scientists that work with USGS at different field stations. And we quite often work with the field station based out of Las Vegas. And that's where they have really sort of the premier scientists working on desert tortoises, bighorn sheep, vegetation issues such as, you know, looking at long-term effects, impacts of climate change on vegetation communities, restoration ecology, all kinds of really important priority research questions that land managers have. Yeah. I mean, it just, the thing I keep thinking of is like, it really takes a village. Like there is a lot going on. And I mean, I didn't even know, I've heard of USGS, but I actually didn't know that it was within the Department of the Interior. So it's, again, each interview I do, I get part of it. I mean, part of the goal of this, inter- like these interviews is to share and broadcast like all that goes into running the national parks. And then there's the like, selfish component for me of I'm like, this is so cool. I'm learning so much, <laughs> you know, like there's just the like knowledge understanding of like, wow, I just think it's cool that because I am someone who I kind of like scatterbrained isn't necessarily the right word, but it's more like I get really interested by a bunch of different things. I'm always really impressed by like scientists or just folks who have committed to a very specific field of study Um, because I'm like how does one like that I don't think I could choose something that specific that just feels crazy I'm with you yeah I'm much more of a generalist that's how I kind of got into really loving uh, working in parks because you're doing all kinds of stuff different things every day is different but last week you know I I met with a handful of people for about six hours talking about Joshua trees. And one of our USGS oh. scientists, Todd Eskew, he's based out of the, the Las Vegas station uh, with USGS. And he, I mean, there's people who have just dedicated their lives to answering really complicated questions, really trying to understand what's happening on dynamic landscapes. And it's it's so hard. I have so much admiration for them and their patience. And Mm -hmm. and being able to be focused like that. It is not a talent that I possess. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. So that was really, you know, it's heartening to be in those meetings when you're really looking at complicated problems, but you're sitting next to people who have been just looking at this stuff for so long and have so much Yeah, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I mean, you mentioned you are a bit more of a generalist, but it seems like a lot of your experience has been more in desert landscapes. I don't know if the Grand Canyon technically falls into desert landscape-esque. I know you had a stint at Point Reyes National Seashore also, which... For folks, I had to look this up. I was I was familiar with it, but I was like, okay, I need to confirm that it's in Northern California. But for folks who are no, are not aware, it's north of San Francisco. But yeah, would you say that you have intentionally focused on desert landscapes, or? Yeah, I would agree with that. My jaunt up to Northern California was definitely out of the desert, um, on the coast. Uh, yeah, like you're saying, just north of uh, San Francisco, this peninsula that juts out into the Pacific Ocean. That has whales going by and elephant seals and amazing 
plant life, super diverse, like incredible biodiversity. Um, anybody who likes birds knows exactly this place because it is one right. of the most. Yeah, you can places. tell I'm not, I'm not one of those people because. <laughs> no judgment. I do not. No judgment. Um, I didn't know that when I went there. I went there for family. Uh, my okay. I'm adopted and my birth mother lives in Santa Rosa. And it was okay. an opportunity to get closer to her and get to know her better and, and get outside my comfort zone. It was a landscape. Um, I had gone to college up there and I grew up in San Diego, but it just wasn't where my training had been. You know, I spent nine years in the desert, really focused. Actually, I suppose you could say I spent like 11 years in the desert if you count my time in the Peace Corps working in Niger in the Sahel. Being around so much rainfall, I mean, it is such a different, different, different environment. Um, but I learned a lot there. I learned probably more about partnerships and relationships than about oh, uh, landscapes in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's a very, um, it's a very complicated area. It's very complicated communities in Marin County. And at the time, there was some unbelievably controversial issues simmering and eventually coming to a head one of which was around non-native species. So there had been two like non-native species of deer introduced to the peninsula that had absolutely exploded. Uh, fallow deer and axis deer that originally came from the San Francisco Zoo and were brought in for hunting purposes. And um, Oh, okay. Yeah, just- What were uh, they hunting? Oh, like pe- people wanted to hunt the deer? Yeah. Or- mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so- uh, th- uh, yeah, so managing a non-native species that has, you know, fur and a face is very controversial. It's very, can be very heartbreaking, but uh, they were doing significant damage to the natural environment there, and they had to be managed, they had to be controlled. Um, and at the end of the day, they were removed from the peninsula. But what was interesting, I thought, is that some of the meat and the hide uh, went to one of the, the locally affiliated tribes, tribal communities, and then a good portion of the meat from the deer uh, were actually sent down to the condor breeding program down in Big Sur. And those baby okay. condors, oh my gosh, they loved the deer meat. They were just like, we don't want to eat that hamburger you've been feeding us anymore. We love we love this. So, you know. But I'm looking at, what is baby condor? Oh, you know, like the condors, like the big giant birds. Oh, no, I actually haven't seen those before. Yeah, they're they're one of the kind of um, poster child for endangered species, almost, you know, similar to the bald eagle condors. They're a relative of the turkey vulture. and Okay. And they like deer meat, apparently. Yeah, they are scavengers. Um, and so... Uh, they, they were almost completely decimated. The entire species was on the brink of extinction until the San Diego oh, wow. Zoo stepped in. And, you know, zoos can provide these great opportunities to try to, you know, collect an- if there's a few animals left, try to get a breeding program going on and then and then ultimately reintroducing that species back into the wild. So okay. I guess it's kind of full circle because my Work at Point Reyes, I, I was not involved directly with that project as a plant ecologist, but knowing about that, and then I ended up going to the Grand Canyon, and there, of course, they have the uh, really another premier condor reintroduction program going on. And oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, these like two really distinct populate, re, re, reintroduced populations of, uh, of condors um, in two different locations was pretty, pretty interesting, very, very different. And to your point, yeah, the, the Grand Canyon is, once you get below the rim, you know, it's uh, on, on the, the north and the south rim, those are really sort of higher elevation conifer communities. Uh, but once you get below the rim and lower and lower down, it becomes quite arid and uh, more typical sort of Sonoran desert habitat. Okay. Yeah, that's especially since you were saying you were a plant ecologist going to Point Reyes, mm-hmm. like it is interesting to kind of, obviously there was probably ecology adjustments and you were learning and learning the different like ecosystems and stuff like that. But yeah, that a lot of your time there was actually learning about different partnerships. And I'm sure you can look back as your, like you said, as a big goal right now, or not even, maybe not even a goal, but just like a big chunk of the superintendency role is those relationship aspects with different partners. And like we talked about, I mean, it's across all levels going from like government, academics, nonprofits, the whole gambit. Uh, But I'm sure seeing how the community was engaged and then how to like de-escalate things and then move forward with decisions, despite maybe there still being disagreement on certain sides, was probably a valuable experience. Oh, incredible. Incredible. You have to step into, you know, 
Well, like anything, really, there's it seems like there's anything that can have controversy or differing, differing opinions. But hopefully that's where better ideas are born, if you're willing right. to listen. And that's that's always been a good takeaway lesson for me is it's OK to be wrong or it's OK to not have it perfect. You know, if someone can step in and daylight some solution you haven't thought of or daylight uh, some aspect that you hadn't considered, and that's really, you know, that's a really important role, I think, for the National Park Service is to to be there to engage, you know, to be there to answer tough questions or explore complicated yeah. ideas, whether that's at our, you know, one of our many hundred national historic sites or within our national parks. All of these 425 units have some aspect that is really challenging, you know, or, yeah. or can, can brew up some questions or, yeah. You had mentioned briefly kind of when talking about places you've had experience with desert climates. You mentioned your time in the Peace Corps. So I'd love to hear about that time. And was that straight after college or what led to that? Yeah, I completed my bachelor's degree in forestry. And during my junior, senior year, uh, I had transferred uh, to Berkeley from UC Davis. And it's a very, very small program. And it afforded me the opportunity to hang out with a lot of grad students that were in the forestry program. There was some great space there, like sort of a lounge and a, a library where people could meet up and connect. And through that, I met quite a few graduate students who had come back from service in the Peace Corps as a volunteer. It really inspired me. A lot of their stories inspired me and encouraged me to apply. And I knew that I was not ready to continue my academic work. I was really happy yeah. to be graduating and just needed a break from school. And so I kind of been in kind of not really knowing exactly what direction I wanted to go. This seemed like a good opportunity to explore ideas, travel, challenge myself. And so, so that sort of led me on that path. I had some experience traveling uh, overseas. My parents are both immigrants from the United Kingdom. And so my mom and dad used to take us to England as often as they could to see family. And so I had some familiarity and some comfort with traveling. And so it was it was a great opportunity. I will say it's probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. It's a you know, it's amazing that uh, the program exists. I'm so thankful that it's still around today. It's a it's so yeah. important. I think I wish I wish there were more opportunities for young people in this country to join the Peace Corps to or AmeriCorps or some of these other programs like VISTA and really challenge yourself, get out of your comfort zone, go work with a community that may be really different than where you grew up, um, learn a new language, learn self-reliance, you know, and self-rescue, how to really just support, stand on your own two feet and, and fix problems that maybe, you know, yeah. you're kind of on your own to fix. I mean, you know, so, so learning some really amazing skills. I don't know that I particularly had much to offer the communities that I was working with, I tried my best for sure. But, you know, I was 22, fresh out of college and uh, didn't really know a whole lot, put it that way. Yeah. How does getting placed work? Do you put, are you just, do you get accepted to the Peace Corps and then you're just assigned to a country or? Yeah. I, you know, okay. it's been a while. Um, hmm. Yeah. It's been over 30 years, I think now. I don't think the process has changed much. Essentially, you're applying, um, you get interviewed maybe more than once, you share, you may select some countries that you're particularly interested in. Okay. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to get placed where they need you and where your skills are. And perhaps if you know right. a language, they're going to put you in a place that you may be familiar with the language. And then you say yes or no, you might get an opportunity to say no once, you know, maybe get another offer and take that. I will say when I got called, I was working a temp job with the University of California at one of the field stations with Berkeley, one of the forestry field stations, which was a great job. Uh, and I just got a call saying, hey, you know, we have an opportunity for you in the Republic of Niger, which is a French pronunciation. Um, English might pronounce it Niger, uh, which is sort of famous for the, the Niger River that runs alongside Mali and uh, through, through Niger. And I literally did not even know what country this was. I was so ignorant. I did not, you know, I, I knew, you know, places, countries like Kenya or obviously South Africa or Namibia or Morocco. I mean, those are the countries that you tend to know um, 
But yeah. Niger, I just had never heard of this country before. And it's huge. You know, it's three times the size of California. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's right on the edge of the oh Sahara gosh. Desert. It has an incredibly rich history and uh, different ethnic communities that live there and multiple languages and a really, you know, yeah, just just an amazing place that it's in the top tier of uh, the most, you know, the poorest countries in the world. And I just, I just did not know what I was getting myself into, but I couldn't have picked, picked a better place, honestly. To, to serve serve my country. Yeah, what type of work did you do when you were there? They have a couple of programs there, and they bring in um, volunteers at two different times of year. At least at least they did at, did at that time. Right. Uh, and at that time, it was uh, more of like an environmental group that would come in, people who had a background in biology, maybe ecology, environmental science, uh, math, that kind of thing. And then you would get placed with villages in a village that – may have had some interest or requested some assistance with doing gardening projects or setting okay. up, installing some uh, some wells, like uh, these tube wells or like really simple technology to excavate in and uh, create a water source for people to water their gardens. So there's sort of that cadre of, of folks. And then the next six months later, they'd bring in a fresh, you know, another group of volunteers that would serve in their community health program would either be family planning related or nutrition related. Niger has some extreme challenges with newborns and nutrition and hydration and waterborne illnesses. Um, Mm. So kind of, you know, really mixed bag of different opportunities there to assist communities in, in different ways. Unfortunately, Niger no longer is able to host the Peace Corps because of some issues that are happening that are, you know, pretty dangerous that are related to to war and terrorism and stuff like that. And it's just, mm. it's really, really heartbreaking because those communities really do need assistance and are really yeah. amazing to work with. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really amazing experience. And I do think there is value for younger, I mean, at any point, but I think, you know, fresh out of college or before college, there's, you have more capacity to do things maybe where you don't have like, yeah, where you can go somewhere for away from home for an extended period of time. And uh, work in a local community. But yeah, I'm sure that it sounds like it was a really uh, educational time. But then, yeah, it sounds hard. I mean, you know, you're out of your comfort zone. When you came back to the U.S., were you did you go straight into the National Park Service or what was that transition like? That, you know, when when people talk about working internationally, you know, they talk about sort of either cultural assimilation into the country that you're moving into. And you might have like culture shock or kind of that change in environment where you're just you're so stimulated by such a different environment, different languages, different traditions, food. I mean, everything is just completely different. And what's interesting is if you talk to any, almost any Peace Corps volunteer, they're going to say that it was harder to come home than it was to go to my host country. Mm. And I think you're working so hard to connect with your host country and just to learn and be a sponge and really become a member of those communities that when you come home, it's like, wow, you've got to do a 180 and reacquaint yourself with this country. And there's a lot that is, you know, coming back to this country after living in Niger was definitely a shock to the system. You know, even just like going to a grocery store, you know, and you're like, you could buy anything you want or there's like, you know, I just remember walking by this deli that just had like a big open, you know, fridge bin full of cheese, like 10 different kinds of cheese, you know, and I hadn't seen cheese in, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, what is that? I yeah, forgot. I mean, just the, the, the abundance here, the abundance, the diversity, the opportunities, the everything is just so rich here. And you mm. certainly get a perspective um, of that having yeah. lived in a much more humble place. The, I studied abroad and so it was only for a short period of time, but I was in Hong Kong for six months when I was in school. And I distinctly remember flying back to the U.S. and like, yes, there is English spoken in Hong Kong more so than mainland China. But, you know, I kind of had just accustomed to tuning things out because I couldn't understand anything. And I was, you know, I was learning Chinese when I was there. But like, you know, I was could maybe say like, hello, I am American. And that was about it. But I remember flying back and I was in the back row of the airplane and the flight attendants were talking in English and it literally felt like they were yelling because I had just gotten so accustomed (laughs) to not being able to understand anything. And I was like, it just was a really weird experience to be like, oh, I can understand this now. And I remember Hong Kong is, you know, being a, um, 
I guess previously part of the UK, like everything's on the left side. And so I remember walking on the right side in the airport and I was like, what? Like it was in, it was not as much a shock to the system. Um, but I do definitely remember coming back and being like, oh, whoa, I adjusted more than I maybe thought I would have. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure it was a big, a much bigger adjustment, but I can definitely empathize with that. Like some of those things that you're like, I didn't. Wow. Yeah. I didn't even realize this would be something I'd need to adjust back to. Yeah. It's, um, it's very, it's very humbling. It's very, it, it has stayed with me for my life, you know? Um, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I would not, I would not be the person I am today if, if I had not been in the Peace Corps and, and specifically been in Niger. Yeah. And so in the mix of kind of adjusting back to the U.S. and like you said, this world of abundance that we can find ourselves in, um, at what point did you start looking towards, I guess, the National Park Service? Obviously, you know, you started working for them at some point because <laughs> I'm speaking to you as superintendent. So when you're in the Peace Corps, if you complete your service successfully, uh, you also you have an opportunity to apply for jobs with the federal government. Oh, yeah. With the, I didn't know that. Um, through through a um, process whereby it's called it's called like a basically you have a hiring authority so you have the status to to apply for jobs that normally would be relegated to people who are already in the federal government that have that hiring authority or that hiring status so it was really a way to get a permanent job that um, many people do struggle with you know if you're in a seasonal position and trying to find that permanent full time job. So um, I came. I came home. I went on a road trip to decompress and see some friends. I eventually got a job back with UC Berkeley doing some temp work as a biologist, and uh, nice. was really a little bit lost. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I was still just trying to adjust to being back in my home country, and had applied for a number of jobs with because I was in had, had my background in forestry I was applying for jobs in the timber industry and okay. uh, you know California has a lot of companies that are working on timber harvesting or wood products and so I applied for a bunch of jobs and uh, nothing that panned out and then I finally reached out I, I looked at a map and I remembered coming to Joshua Tree to go camping when I was in college, and I thought, hmm, this is pretty close to San Diego. I've just lived, you know, whatever, 10,000 miles away from my family for a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's a good idea to, to live a little bit closer. And so I literally just called the park. And back then, you know, I didn't, I might have had email. I don't really remember having email then, but I called the park. I asked about jobs and I just called the visitor center and they happened to transfer me to the biologist, the vegetation uh, specialist in the park. And he happened to be a former Peace Corps volunteer. And he had really? served, yeah, he had served in um, the Philippines okay. and he completely knew what I was going through. Like he just, we totally connected and he was so kind to help me apply for a job and talk to me about some opportunities. And it took a while, it took a, a little bit, but he had, he had a few opportunities that I could apply for. And one of them ended up panning out. I really got lucky because I was um, I was one of the top two candidates to come in as a temporary, like a two year job, I think it was, to manage help help manage the native plant nursery and work on some restoration, okay. some ecological restoration projects. And so it was between me and this other person, and and this other person was also returned Peace Corps volunteer. Wow! Which I couldn't believe from Burkina Faso. She still works uh, up at Glacier National Park. And wow. so she got the job, which of course she, she should have. She was way more qualified than me, but uh, she ended up turning it down. She accepted it. And then she called back and said, hey, I really love working in Glacier. And I've kind of got this great gig going on here. So then I got a call back saying, hey, are you still interested? And uh, yeah, it, I think it was like, it was either December 23rd or the 24th. And so I get this oh, call. Wow. Yeah. And it's like right before the holidays, I'm like, boohoo, poor me. I don't have a job. Pity party. <laughs> Pity party. I've been home for a year. And, and sure enough, uh, I was in my car like two weeks later moving out to 29 Palms. Wow. Yeah. it's it's. I feel like there's a little bit of a, I don't want to say pipeline, but I 
talked with Sue Fritzke, who's the former superintendent of Capitol Reef. She just retired, but she also went to the Park Service right after she did the Peace Corps in Ecuador. And yeah, it's interesting. I think I didn't know about the like, I can see it makes sense kind of because I actually think if I'm remembering David Smith, so he was struggling getting a full time position and actually worked for the Border Patrol for a few years to then move into the National Park Service full time. So it's definitely helpful that you had the like Peace Corps experience to move into that full time position. So that's cool. Yeah. And fortuitous that that person happened to, like you said, know what you were going through and be patient and kind and encouraging to you in that time. Yeah, I feel really, really lucky. I've had some great mentors along the way to help me get where I am for sure. Yeah, the jumping, I mean, one, it's cool that your first position within the park services was at Joshua Tree, and then now you get to be superintendent. So like, that's amazing. Um, But I'm in some interviews and some like article interviews that I read in preparation for our conversation, you mentioned Minerva Hoyt a bit, and I'd love to understand for folks who don't know who she is, kind of what she means to you and to your leadership at Joshua Tree. Yeah, she, so Minerva Hoyt um, is sort of, I think she's referred to as the the founder of Joshua Tree, you know, the fairy godmother of Joshua Tree, Um, whatever, however you want to describe her. She is somebody who epitomizes sort of that notion of the power of one, you know, being you know, what, what can one person do on this planet to make a difference? And she was a person who I think was probably stubborn and laser focused on uh, conservation of the California desert. You know, she, uh, if I recall correctly, had lost her husband and took on, uh, you know, just basically really was into gardening and landscaping and, and took it upon herself to pay attention to what was going on in the Southern California region and really notice that people were landscaping with desert plants, you know, these beautiful cacti specimens. And it occurred to her that these plant specimens must come from somewhere. And uh, she came out uh, to the Palm Springs region and an area called the Devil's Garden, I believe. And had heard, had seen this beautiful area previously, and then had seen it uh, decimated as people were coming and digging up cacti to relocate them into people's yards for landscaping. So, so here's somebody who's like connecting the dots, right? Like she's, she's maybe got, um, she's in a, a position of privilege that gives her some free time, some time that she can commit to something like, you know, investigating this problem, learning about it, traveling, traveling to the desert, understanding the region, understanding the landscape, and, and, and understanding the law to know that the Antiquities Act, well, both through, through either Congress, an act of Congress, you know, a national park unit can be established or national park, or through the Antiquities Act, you know, that a sitting president can designate a national park unit mm. either as a monument, as, as a monument. And so, you know, she was politically connected. She uh, recruited a pretty well-known photographer named Stephen Willard to travel in the desert and take pictures to really photo document what she was seeing out here that inspired her, that she thought was worthy of preservation. So, you know, someone who really could put this package together to understand the problem, to understand the landscape, to know the players, to know yeah. that she had to create a compelling reason for somebody in Washington, D.C. to think this place was important, you know, and she couldn't just say like, hey, get on Google Earth and you're just going to be blown away because it's so cool <laughs> and you're going to love it and you're going to want to protect it, you know, so that's not happening. You know, she couldn't say like, hey, pick up this coffee table book that's talks about this beautiful place and has cool pictures because that didn't exist. You know, all that existed at the time was probably predominantly a misperception of what the arid Southwest was about, that it perhaps worthless, that there was no resources there. There's no trees or water or dams you can build. So like, what do you do with this area? It seems like, you know, there's nothing of value there. And she could, she was able to inspire people through her partnership with this guy, this photographer to create beautiful photo album to oh, that's capture cool. the spirit of this place, really beautiful black and white photographs. That photo album is literally like a hundred yards from where I'm standing in our museum collections. We could go in there and, and look at it. And she had this crazy idea, which was brilliant to recreate desert scenes uh, by creating these dioramas in box cars on a train. 
And so she got a couple of these, few of these box cars and she, she literally like cre- recreated these desert landscapes and like had, wow. like a, you know, a taxidermied coyote or a taxidermied kangaroo rat or whatever. And this thing traveled around and people could see it and kind of get people excited about it. Like, whoa, this is really interesting. It's so diverse. There's so many different plants and animals and um, the scene, the scenery, you know, so she's brilliant at marketing. She's brilliant at telling the story. She's brilliant at coercing people to get behind her and, and eventually, you know, caught the ear of then uh, President Roosevelt. It didn't, it didn't make its way through Congress successfully. So she worked the other angle of it and was able to designate the National Monument. Yeah, that's, I love what you said of, um, she highlights the power of one. I think right now it's Probably maybe always, but I think it's easy to be like, oh, there's so many problems. What can we do? And just being reminded of those stories where, I mean, granted, she went about it at a, in a very like strategic way, which is so cool. I mean, so creative. And like you said, was able to g- really grasp. She had a goal of like preserving this landscape and was able to grasp what those barriers were to make that a possibility. Um, that's, I mean, it's impressive. That's awesome. Yeah, I agree. Heck yeah. What? I mean, you've been at Joshua Tree, you know, the first place you were in your career and then in your previous position and now as superintendent, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges Joshua Tree faces within, you know, just in general and compared to other parks, maybe in the park service? I think, you know, the three main challenges the park faces is, is one, again, this notion of sustainable tourism, you know, to really maintain uh, a sanctuary in, in Southern California for people to come to, to experience wilderness, to experience dark night skies, to experience, you know, quiet, to experience challenge and adventure, you know, scrambling on rocks or maybe setting up, you know, camp for the first time or backpacking into a remote area, you know, or, or picnicking with your family. Like all of those things are so important, but how to do that yeah. sustainably, you know, when we have, we only have so many parking spaces, we only have so many campsites, you know, so how to figure out that puzzle and, and, can, and manage yeah. that sustainably so that, you know, when your kids, kids or your friends, kids, kids come out here, that they can still have those experiences that they're not somehow lost or damaged. That's going to be a continuous challenge as long as we're, we're hosting over 3 million people a year. I know that's a lot. Mm-hmm. And in a pretty concentrated area. It's not quite like the South Rim of the Grand Canyon, you know, where you have really super, super concentrated vis- visitation there, but it's fairly concentrated here in our sort of the top northwestern quadrant of the park. You know, the other challenge is, is like I was saying, you know, parks are not islands. Um, we're surrounded by other federal lands. We're surrounded by private land. And, you know, this, this area is becoming really, you know, not just the park is a sanctuary, but these communities are becoming sanctuaries for people that are looking to buy their first home or buy land or buy a place that they can, you know, have a little bit more of a rural lifestyle, get to, you know, have a little smaller community. And that's putting some pressure on the park, you know, when you have, you know, sort of development development happening around the perimeter. And it has to be, you know, it's something that's that I'm trying to really focus on engaging with education and outreach and partnership that if we can somehow do that collaboratively, this management, and rather than having, say, you know, miles of our boundary that every house has a trail that comes out of that house and there's a developed trail up into the park. Is there some way we can concentrate our use? We can still enjoy coming in the park, but perhaps be as light on the land as we as we can be. Um, you know, that's a challenge that that we're we're working on, and I don't see that changing in the in the coming years. And then lastly, you know, we have a multifaceted sort of approach to how we're managing, I shouldn't use the word managing, it's not really managing, how we're responding to climate change related issues. So yeah, as part of that whole portfolio, um, whether it's the climate change component or visitation or what's happening around our perimeter, all of those things can impact different resources, whether that's our archaeological sites, you know, whether we have vulnerabilities to graffiti or looting Mm -hmm. or other types of damage. Um, We have a number of historic structures in the park, you know, old mining sites, mining camps, different um, constructed sites that were associated with the mining of that period. And they're they're all made out of wood (laughs) and wood burns. And we're looking at increased fire frequency and fire intensity here. 
And so those places are extremely vulnerable to fire. And that's something that once those burn up, they're gone forever. We can't recreate those, not with any, you know, any real authenticity or, you know, the park service is not in the business of making fake stuff, you know, (laughs) That's the original Keys Ranch. Once that burns down, that is gone forever. Yeah. So, you know, and along those same lines, the same with vegetation and wildlife that might be impacted by a drier, hotter climate. All of those are kind of in that same bucket of, you know, the challenges that we're trying to sort out and best manage for in the face of uncertainty. And is the climate change that Joshua Tree will mostly, most likely experience and is experiencing, it is typically a drier and hotter climate, or can there be fluctuations with like increased rainfall or something like that? Yeah, it it is on a trajectory for hotter and drier, um, but how much drier is a little bit unknown based on the modeling. So um, modeling, you know, the longer we're trying to understand this problem, the better our information gets, the more refined it gets, especially when we're ground truthing that, like collecting data real time out on the landscape. But when the trajectory of precipitation is, is somewhat uncertain, we know that it will be offset by the, the heating and drying aspects. So even if we have yeah. uh, higher frequency rainfall, like monsoonal events, maybe more frequent or more intense, that moisture could be offset by increased heating uh, of the environment. So that's a lot of evapotranspiration and drying off of, uh, you know, so just something to keep in mind, you know, kind of in that space is, um, or, you know, certainly one trajectory is that we we do have less rainfall. That's kind of the trajectory we're on right now. Uh, But again, that data is uncertain. The farther out you get into the future, the less certain it becomes. And so we're just kind of in in this space of uncertainty. We are putting one foot in front of the other. We know that Joshua trees are extremely vulnerable. We know that it's the namesake for the park. We know that we would be remiss in not trying to preserve and conserve this species within the park's boundary. Um, But we also know that we might fail. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hard thing to, to not know. You know, it's like we're going to put effort into preserving this, but it might our my for, our efforts might not be enough. Yeah. yeah. One question I've been thinking about is, and partially this is just in the diversity of the parks in the like park system in the U.S. There's a lot of different. I think search and rescue is a huge part of each park service. Mm-hmm. Um, what do those? Because I'm thinking I just talked to the Voyager superintendent. And like, you know, there's a lot of boat rescues and stuff like that. What are your search and rescue? I don't know if missions is the right word, but are they usually around like dehydration and stuff like that? Yeah. So parks really, well, anybody who manages a park of any kind, state park, county park, national parks, we all are engaged in some, to some extent with, you know, the safety of our visitors and, uh, depending on the activities people are engaging in, you know, there's varying levels of risk. And it is very important, especially in big wilderness areas. You know, one of the tenets of the the Wilderness Act, which is a federal law, is that we provide outstanding opportunities for primitive recreation, for recreation that Mm. depends on your self-reliance your ability to have the skills and techniques or pre-planning that you need to have your adventure and that not everything has a guardrail, right? Yeah. And and that's what that's what's important too, you know, that that uh, we recognize that there is some element of risk and that's part of it's part of what parks provide and in these big spaces provide. Um, but at the same time, we have a responsibility to look at sort of those common denominators of risk that, that most often lead to injury or fatalities and take a look at that and see if there's something that we can mitigate for. And I mean, hands down, if you look at any, many, many parks, not just desert parks, that uh, people who perhaps aren't as prepared as they, they should be, who don't have adequate food and water, that's like a real basic, you know. You, you're taking on a hike or a climb or a whatever, a bike ride. And if you don't have adequate food and water, if you don't tell people where you're going, you know, that's where we get into that, you know, hazard zone. Um, you, we've had people that are rock climbing all day long that might be backpacking in the most extreme areas. But those folks tend to plan ahead. They tend to have, you know, the talent and the expertise and the knowledge in the pre-planning to take care of themselves and have those really important experiences. But 
the challenges we have here are typically around, as you're saying, uh, whether it's dehydration, some kind of heat related illness, uh, twisted mm. ankles are really common. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Just like, I think across the country, if you look at just accidents in general, you know, you're walking to your car or whatever, it slips, trips and falls are always, you know, pretty much one of the main <laughs> dangerous ways yeah. people get injured. And, and that can happen to anybody. You can be so careful. You could be well prepared and all that stuff. And you can still step on a rock and twist your ankle or, you know, oh, yeah. it just happens. So as far as the education component goes, we have a really big um, uh, program we call preventative search and rescue. And uh, that's modeled out of the Grand Canyons program. They, they developed that many mm-hmm. years ago. It's really, really effective. It's basically trying to intercept people before they get out on the trail to give them some information okay. and uh, give them an opportunity to make a better decision if maybe what they're doing is not is not a great idea. They're not prepared. They may not have what they need. They may not know what they're getting themselves into. So that's that's that space where we really try to focus. Our energy is in that preventative rather than, than sort of after the fact. Yeah. The superintendent of Voyagers National Park said, and it's interesting because it's making me think of, like he was talking about it from a preservation perspective, but he said preservation is less expensive than restoration. And it's similar, honestly, in like preventative search and rescue, like it is more effective because search and rescue efforts, like it takes a lot of effort and resources and time and it, you know, can not not always be successful, but it it takes, you know, I don't want to say less effort, but it's more just like providing people with the information and is more beneficial to upfront, um, see how you can kind of dissuade some of those risks. So that's a cool program. Yeah, no, that's, that's the fundamental principle, you know, try to prevent prevent where we can. It's better for the resource in the park. You know, we don't want to be landing helicopters yeah. in wilderness, rescuing people. Yeah, true. I will, I will make a shameless plug for um, the NPS app, which is a, an app that you can download. And it, it has the most accurate trail data. Unfortunately, oh. you know, crowdsource trail data, trail data you might get from another app that, you know, provides trail maps. You know, there's there's a, a number of companies, a number of different sources for this information, but none of those are validated or uh, specifically, you know, the actual maintained trails of the park that, you know, if you if you hike on one of these trails, there's at least going to be a little bit of signage. They're going to be maintained. And those are going to be the most common places, you know, if something happens that we know where to find somebody. And so we're really yeah. trying to promote the use of our of our app as the safest, oh, uh, best cool. source of trail information. You can use it offline, just like other programs. You don't have to have um, cell service to do it. And it's going to put you on the right the right path in the right place to minimize impacts to resources and maximize your safety. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. I know that we have spent a good amount of time together, so I appreciate your just time and energy and sharing some of your experiences. A question that I like to wrap up conversations with is, what is something that you wish everyone knew about Joshua Tree National Park, regardless of if they have or haven't been? Hmm. Let me think. I would say um, the desert... The desert here at Joshua Tree will will provide everything you need for your experience if you plan ahead. But do not come here uh, without planning ahead. You know, it's it, it's a great place for spontaneity and creativity, but it is a wild landscape that uh, that demands that you sort of I would say maybe show some respect and have your act together and think a little bit before you come out here. That's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's good to be reminded that sometimes in these wild nature places, like they are more powerful than we are. And I sp- have spent the past four years living in New York City. So it's very easy to forget that. <laughs> um, like when you were talking about bringing food everywhere, I, I feel like that time has programmed me to just expect if I'm hungry, like I expect a pizza place to be open on the corner whenever <laughs> I want it. And right. so it's like, that's obviously not sustainable for everywhere. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a good a good tip it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I would, and you know, and I would just remind visitors to remember, like, you're not the first person to come here. People have loved and lived on this landscape for thousands of years. And many of those mm. communities are alive and well and surround the park. Uh, a lot of our tribal communities that are affiliated with Joshua Tree have reservations from, gosh, from Highland 
over to the Colorado River and north and south. And uh, it's important to remember that. And I would invite people to come to our visitor center in downtown 29 Palm. Mm. So we'll learn a little bit more about those tribal communities. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate that, Jane. Well, thank you for your time. Um, it's been awesome chatting with you and hearing a little bit about your story. It was good to talk to you too, Maddie. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening today. Our music was composed by Danielle Bees. If you liked this podcast, rate, review, download, and tell your friends about it. This ensures the stories of our national parks and how they are run are shared. Listen to the other episodes wherever you listen to your podcasts or visit us at whorunsthispark.com to learn more. I'm Maddie Pellman, and you've been listening to Who Runs This Park.